This quadcopter can allegedly go 160 miles an hour. You can definitely tell the ESC is struggling. And I say allegedly because the FAA would be super annoyed if I went over 100 miles an hour. So it can allegedly go 160 miles an hour. And the way that it does that is by having super high KV motors that are designed for 4S batteries and you just slap a 6S battery on it and it goes 160 miles an hour. No. If you've ever tried to design a top speed quadcopter, you know it's not quite that simple. The parts that go into this quadcopter were carefully selected by Phantom FPV who came up with the original design. And one of the challenges in the original design was picking an ESC that wouldn't explode and fire when subjected to the abuse of running a 2600 kV motor on a 6S battery. And that's why this is the perfect way to test this new SkyStars flight controller and ESC. Because if an ESC can survive this kind of abuse, it must be at least half decent. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Starting on this side of the flight controller, we have the receiver inputs, and I was at first really confused to see an S bus input here. Usually it's F4 flight controllers that have a dedicated pad for S bus with an inverter on it. Uh, F7 flight controllers can do S bus on any UART. So what is this doing here? And then I realized that this is the wiring for the Cadex or DJI Air Unit, or you could use Walksnail or whatever. Uh, they wire up the same. Uh, we've also got 5 volt, 3.3 volt, and another UART, UART number 5, here, as well as another 5 volt and a ground. And of course, you could use that for anything that you need a UART for. Coming around to this side of the flight controller, we've got a video transmitter output, an analog video transmitter output. We've got a TX a UART TX, and that is intended for smart audio. There's no RX here because smart audio only requires TX, and they're trying to keep the wiring simple. Here is the VTX Plus output. And if we look right here on the underside of the flight controller, if you look very carefully, there are two sets of solder bridges. One of those solder bridges controls whether the real pit function works. If you enable the real pit function, you'll be able to turn the power to the video transmitter on and off using an aux mode uh, in the Betaflight modes tab. If you disable the real pit function, the video transmitter will be powered up all the time. Some people prefer to do that just to keep things simple. The other jumper here controls whether or not the VTX gets 5 volts or 10 volts. That is not bridged by default, and if you don't bridge it, and you're going to need to probably you get under here with your soldering iron and bridge it carefully, some people may need to just take this whole thing off and, and separate it from the ESC. If you don't bridge that, the video transmitter won't power up. Of course, if you have a 5 volt video transmitter and you feed it 10 volts, it's going to fry. So make sure you get that right. Continuing along, we've got some pads for the receiver. And they've got some examples here of a FreeSky S-Bus receiver and a Crossfire receiver. Crossfire would wire up the same as uh, Express LRS if you've got that. And they're suggesting that you wire that to TX1 and RX1 here. Again, they're suggesting UART1 be used for a rear receiver, although you could use any UART that you prefer. Uh, we've also got 5 volt and ground to power the receiver, very conveniently located. Uh, a note that if you do wire up your receiver here to TX1 and RX1, for example, you've got a crossfire receiver, you would then not want to wire up this S-Bus pad to your uh, DJI video transmitter because they would conflict with each other potentially and not work. This is also UART 1, so you can only have one thing on each UART at a time. Next we've got the camera outputs and the camera is set up for 5 volts only. That's fine. Most cameras today will work on 5 volts and don't need VBAT, although many of them can accept it. And we've got another UART here, UART number 2, for whatever peripherals we might want to use. I see. They've got the LED strip pad here for programmable LEDs. I was going to say, why is the LEDs wired up to the UART, but they're not. Uh, and uh, they're running the LEDs off the 5 volt regulator here. That's fine. I also noticed that they've got a TVS diode. This is very nice to help protect against voltage spikes. Uh, many flight controllers don't have a TVS diode on board. It adds a small amount of cost and takes up a little bit of space, and many manufacturers just don't bother. It's a very good sign that Skystars have decided to do this. Um, it, I, there still could be things wrong with their flight controller, I just don't know. But this is, at least their head's in the right place. I don't know about the execution. 
We've got a barometer on board. That's exciting. And I don't know about this board specifically, but other the Skystar's F4 board does have an iNav target. Since this has a barometer on board, it suggests that it might have an iNav target. Uh, and there's another UART here, UART 4, which can be used for... Uh, for a GPS. Uh, and also, we've got the SCL and SDA pads, which are needed to uh, connect to a compass, which again is, that that probably means that, when you see a flight controller with a barometer and the SDA, SCL pads, 99% of the time they'll have an INAV target, so that is nice for people who want to fly autonomous flying instead of more acro flying. One thing I would change about the design of this flight controller is that it would be really nice if this 5-volt pad over near the GPS would power up from USB. That allows you to power up the GPS unit by plugging USB into the flight controller without plugging a battery into the quad, and therefore the GPS unit can get its lock on the satellites without the electrical noise from the video transmitter uh, messing it up. This speeds up the time to GPS lock, and in some cases can make the difference between getting lock at all and not getting lock. Uh, it is worth noting that the five volt pad over on the receiver side of the flight controller does power up from USB, and so you could use that, or you could use the nearby 3.3 volt pad if your GPS is rated for 3.3 volts. Well, I've just about finished putting this together, and I thought I would show you the ESC part because uh, beta flights, beta flight, and INAFs, INAF, but AM32, you may not have seen before. Uh, so here I am at esc-configurator.com, which is a web-based ESC configurator. It works in Google Chrome. I'm not sure what other browsers it works in, uh, but uh, it's the simplest way to configure and flash BLHeli S, BlueJ, and AM32 ESCs. Uh, it doesn't work with BLHeli32. That's proprietary, and that's sort of the whole point of AM32, is that it's not proprietary. It's open source. Uh, and uh, the parameters we've got here, let's take a look at them and just sort of compare them to what we would see with BLHeli S or BLHeli 32, see if anything is new here. Uh, and some of the things here definitely aren't new, like complementary PWM, which is just braking. That means that when the throttle goes down, the ESC will actively slow the motor as opposed to just letting friction and air resistance slow it down. It's essentially mandatory for multi-rotors because they need the fastest motor response on both acceleration and deceleration. Variable PWM frequency uh, changes the PWM frequency that's used to drive the motors between 24 and 48K. Uh, this can help avoid mid-throttle oscillations and other kinds of sort of subtle disturbances. Sometimes it causes more problems problems than it solves, and so you can choose to turn that off. And I think because we're really pushing things on this ESC, I think we're going to turn it off and we're going to leave the PWM frequency static. Uh, I think that's more likely to give us safe, non-explosive results when, when pushing the ESC as hard as we're going to push it. Uh, stuck rotor protection, uh, we're going to leave that on. That just helps keep you from uh, blowing the ESC if you get caught in a branch or something, and that's a similar, BL Heli 32 has a similar thing. And stall protection tries to detect when the uh, motor is spinning slow enough that the motor could stall. Now this is something that Betaflight also has built in. Betaflight has a default idle speed. Um, the advantage of stall protection is that Betaflight's idle speed may not uh, be correct for every sort of paradigm that the quad finds itself in. So the way that the airflow is moving through the motor can cause the motor to stall when, when normally if it was hovering, maybe it wouldn't. Um, however, Betaflight also has now in Betaflight 4.3 dynamic idle. And I would say if you're using dynamic idle, don't use stall protection here. You would only, I would only consider using stall protection uh, if, uh, well, uh, actually not recommended for multi-rotors. Never mind. I wouldn't use stall protection at all on uh, multi-rotor according to this tool tip. Next, we've got the timing, and uh, t higher timings tend to give you more power at the expense of efficiency, a little bit more heat buildup, especially for a high RPM motor uh, in a situation like this where you are more likely to get desyncs, you want the highest timing possible. If I could set it to something higher than 23, I probably would, but 23 is as high as it goes, and uh, so we're gonna leave it there. The motor KV is only used to set the RPM limit for the low, uh, for the, uh, low RPM throttle protection. Uh, we, I don't think we're using stall protection, but let's go ahead and set this correctly, about 2,600 RPM, and we're going to set the motor poles uh, to 14, which is also correct. 
Mm, startup power. I might consider reducing startup power because these high KV motors, uh, maybe if we kick them too hard to get them started, they'll be more likely to fry. I would consider it, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to leave it on the default because I'm not 100% sure that would be beneficial. And we're going to let the defaults speak for themselves. As far as PWM frequency goes, the lower the PWM frequency, the more torque the motor generates, the higher the PWM frequency, the smoother it runs. And I think in this case, we're going to leave it on 24K, the lowest, because that's going to give us the most torque and theoretically the most speed. And then if we come down here, there's a few other options. Uh, this ESC could have censored motors. That's interesting. I don't know if BL Heli 32 is capable of working with censored motors, uh, but multi rotors don't use censored motors. That's still interesting. Uh, and then there's one other thing that's pretty cool, which is sinusoidal startup. And what sinusoidal, this is a feature that is uh, very, very desirable in KISS ESCs. Instead of starting the motor and just going, whoosh, 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 it goes, it's like a soft start. It has no practical effect, but it looks freaking cool. And finally, people who don't use KISS can have access to it. But I've found that if you use sinusoidal startup and you leave the motors at low throttle for too long, they get super hot. So I'm gonna turn it off, but you may wanna play with this. It's so freaking cool to see. And that's basically it. There are some knobs and dials that BL, BL Heli 32 gives you that AM32 seems not to give you. BL Heli 32 has an acceleration speed parameter that changes how fast the motor can change speed. It's got a couple of different startup parameters. There's more stuff in BL Heli 32, but at the end of the day, what really matters is how it flies. And we're gonna see that in just a second. All right, let's start this flight test with something very simple and straightforward. This is Betaflight 4.3. It's complete default PIDs and filters. Everything is at the default. And this is a 4S battery. This should be just a normal flying racing drone. The uh, GPS hasn't gotten locked yet, but that's okay. We're not gonna do any speed tests right this minute anyway. Let's do some throttle punches. Ooh, a little trilly oscillation there. It's flying. Nothing too crazy. It's fast. I am intentionally being aggressive with the throttle. Oh, 3.5. And going into turns hard to try to bring out. Any problems with the PID tune, any, uh, I mean, um, I think it could be PID tuned just a little sharper but pretty good. Beta flight defaults, no. Uh, excessively hot motors. They're a little hot, but I was pushing them. Yeah, it's a little hotter than I would expect for what we were doing, but it's not the end of the world. No crazy problems with pid tunes like bounces or dipping arms or trilling oscillation. For the most part, I'd say it passed that test. Now, let's take it to 6S. For this flight, we are going to be using a 6S battery, but I have used a 66% motor output limit. So the voltage going through this will be 6S voltage, but the flight controller will be scaling down the motor output to the equivalent RPM of a 4S battery. This is kind of an intermediate step between going whole hog 6S and, and just running a 4S battery. Let's see how she do. Little throttle punches to try and feel out. Throttle drops normally. No excess electrical noise or anything causing it to want to fly away. 
We shouldn't notice much difference in terms of the speed compared to 4S because the motor RPM is going to be the same. Let's just push the ESC a little and push the flight controller and see if anything bad comes out. Meh, seems fine. Alrighty, time to get the real 6S and do it. So now we got a 6S battery with the full 100% Betaflight motor output limit on these 2600 kV motors. These are going to be spinning ridiculously fast, generating a ridiculous amount of electrical noise. It's going to make the gyro want to freak out. Potentially voltage spikes are going to make the ESC fry. We just don't know. Okay, so that's going to be a no. Conveniently self-removing battery. <laughs> uh, it's not that big of a surprise that on Betaflight default PIDs, when you give the quadcopter something this powerful, that it freaks the F out. I kind of expected that that was going to happen, but I wanted to just let the science speak for itself. Let's go in and let's tweak the filters and the PIDs to something a little more reasonable. To be fair, that was also what you had to do with the original flight controller that was on here, so it's only fair to do it here. And I think what I will do in lieu of something more nuanced is I'm just going to turn these filters as aggressive as I can. Okay, so that's where it says, ah, it may cause flyaways. Let's just turn these filters the most filtering we can possibly get, and we'll go to PID profile. Oh, I didn't save that. Uh, we'll hit save. And we'll go to PID profile, and we'll turn the PIDs down to something. How low will it let me get them? No, I don't want PIDs of zero. Uh, let's just turn the PIDs down to like 0 0.5. And that's going to reduce these gains and maybe be more proportional to the amount of power that it's actually outputting. Now bear in mind that even though I've lowered the PIDs and made the filters much more aggressive, the full voltage is going through the motors, the ESC is handling the full voltage, and the motors will make their full RPM. So we should get pretty much just as much straight line power. The handling or flight feel might need more tuning of the PIDs. Oof. Wow, okay, the throttle's a lot more touchy, that's to be expected. Let's see if the gyro's freaking out of the PID controller. Oh, a little shudder there, do you see that? Oh, yeah. Something's not entirely happy. Let's do a punch. Oh, I heard a prop deflecting. So much RPM that these Gemfan F4 props couldn't handle it. Uh, these were not the props used for the 160 mile an hour run. Those were stiffer APC props. Oh, it gets, it gets from point A to point B, don't it? Whoo, it does get up. Oh, the props are not happy. But the ESC is not exploding. Let's see if we can work it. Oh, she gets from point A to point B real fast. Ooh. It's holding in there. <laughs> those props do not like those RPMs. These are not top speed props. I wouldn't be surprised if they actually just exploded at some point if I keep doing that. Am I killing my battery? My battery's dead. Oh, it killed my battery. I forgot it. Oh, yeah. Oops. 2.5. Oh, it's coming back up. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Uh, you don't get the same flight time when you're doing this nonsense as you do. 
<laughs> when you're flying on normal battery. <laughs> so what's the final word on this Sky Stars stack? Did it pass the test? Yes, it did pass the test. It flew 6S, 2600 kV without exploding. And that's saying a lot, because a lot of ESCs wouldn't tolerate the kind of abuse I was giving it. But I don't feel like it quite got the, the sort of gold star in the class. Because I compared the PIDs and filters that I had to put on this flight controller to get it to not just try to fly to the moon, and they were significantly lower than the PIDs and filters that were on the original flight controller that was on there. And I don't know whether that's the electrical design of the flight controller, the gyro chip, or the ESC, the way the sort of noise filtering of the ESC is set up, that could all factor in there. I feel pretty confident that if you were to put this stack on a, a normal rig, it would fly pretty good. But maybe you wouldn't be able to push the filters quite as far as on something that maybe was a little more inherently clean. That could just be a consequence of the 20 millimeter size though. To be honest with you, there was originally a 30 millimeter ESC on this because there, we couldn't think of a single 20 millimeter that would even survive. And this one did survive. At least one pack. With no crashes. That doesn't mean that I am personally vouching for the durability and quality of every single SkyStar stack in the world. This is just one that I got and ran it through some abuse and it did survive the abuse, which says something. But uh, SkyStars, to my mind, doesn't have the same reputation as a qu company like an Acon or a Team Motor that you really know that you can count on. But it did survive the test, and if you're interested in picking it up, if it seems perfect for your build, there's links down in the video description where you could pick them up. They are affiliate links, and that means that when you click any purchase after clicking that link, I get a small commission. It's an easy way for you to support me, and it doesn't cost you anything. Do you want to see this quadcopter definitely not go 160 miles an hour, because that would get the, me in trouble with the FAA? I'll put a card on screen, and you can definitely not see that happen.